Hello everyone, today we are going to talk about dumping. What is dumping? It is considered as international price discrimination and part of what we consider as unfair trade practices. The other type of unfair trade practices that is also particularly relevant in international trade law is subsidization. So granting a benefit to some exporters in a given country which also has a distortive effect on international trade. And what we shall also discuss a little bit in this connection are so-called safeguard measures, i.e. measures WTO members may take if a sudden and unexpected surge of imports causes or threatens to cause injury to their domestic industry. So, without further ado, we'll start with the definition of dumping. It means, in general, that a product is being sold at a lower price abroad than the one that is charged at home. So international price discrimination, as we said already. And itself, dumping is not prohibited, but WTO regulates the measures a member may take against such practices by producers but in other states. Usually, they charge an extra import duty on the particular duty from the particular export country. What does that mean? You try to bring the price closer to the normal value with the aim of removing the injury or the threat of injury such a dumping procedure or a dumping in general may cause. And in this connection, two of the general WTO rules are not applicable or not fully applicable. On the one hand, most for a nation. Why not? Because in general, as we said in earlier sessions, all other trading partners have to be treated equally. However, if one trading partner or producers from one trading partners engage in dumping, you may charge higher tariffs than usual and only on their products and not on all others as well, because they are the ones who are being dumping. The other major deviation from general trade law here is from Article 2, which states that tariff bindings, the schedule of concessions, are obligatory. What do we mean by that? States have, as a result of numerous trade rounds and other negotiations increasingly committed themselves to decrease their tariffs and to bind their tariffs. So they would say they apply a maximum of say 5% on a given product. However, if they engage in dumping or producers engage in dumping, then you may charge an additional anti-dumping duty because again, the reason is, or the aim behind it is, to bring up the price back to the normal value, i.e. the value that would exist if there had been no dumping. And this extra duty, this anti-dumping duty, at the end of the day, can mean that dumping, or I'm sorry, the tariff is higher than the one that a state has obliged itself to in the schedule of concessions. A few minutes also on subsidies and safeguards. When it comes to subsidies, which also have a distortive effect on international trade, members of the WTO can react. On the one hand, they can use the WTO dispute settlement procedure to seek the withdrawal of the subsidy if it is being harmful to the domestic industry in the target country, or they may charge an extra duty. In this connection, it is called a countervailing duty on the subsidized imports hurting the domestic producers. And last but not least, safeguards. These are so-called emergency actions if there is a sudden and unexpected and significant increase of imports of particular products if they cause or threaten to cause serious injury to the importing member's domestic industry. That is being regulated in Article 19 of the GATT and in addition there is also an agreement on safeguards that includes numerous rules for the application of safeguard measures. So further lays out the details of so-called safeguard measures. So on the one hand, countries may impose higher tariffs than the ones they have committed themselves to in their schedules of concessions, or they may even impose more restrictions. However, these are exceptional measures, so they are only allowed on an exceptional basis and also only for a limited period of time. And what you can already see here is that all of these three different types of actions WTO members may take are regulated not only in the GATT but also in additional agreements that have more detailed rules on these measures. So, about dumping then. The general definition is exporting 
a product at a price lower than the price that is normally being charged on the home market of a certain producer, hence international price discrimination. There are lots of economic and political debates surrounding dumping. On the one hand, you may ask yourself, is that really unfair? In the short run, from a consumer's perspective, you could argue, where's the problem? Products becoming more cheaper? Great, that's what we have free markets for. On the other hand, there is also a lot of possibility, and in a negative sense, there are lots of possibilities to abuse anti-dumping measures for protectionist purposes. So governments frequently take actions to defend their own domestic industries from dumping, but on the other hand, however, when it comes to the calculation of the anti-dumping duty or the determination whether there is dumping in the first place, there is also some leeway for reasons or for actions that are being taken that are not designed to only protect them from unfair trade practices, but also to protect them from what we consider as usual competition from abroad. And that's what we want, right? Competition from other countries, from consumers in other countries, to exercise pressure, to become more efficient, to become simply better at producing goods. However, we have to think about the short run and the long run here, because also if we speak about consumers, in the short run, these products might be cheaper, artificially cheap. In the long run, however, there is a strategy behind dumping. And usually the strategy is to drive out domestic competitors out of the market, to establish a monopoly or at least an oligopoly, so a dominant market position. Once you're the dominant player on a given market, you can exploit your dominance, meaning that you can raise prices again and raise them at much higher levels than before you started to engage in dumping. So in theory, you could now say, okay, once a company has established itself as the dominant or the sole player on a given market, once you raise prices again and these prices are too high, that creates space for other companies. But think of cost intense, intense or otherwise very intense products and complex products. This may take years or competitors might not even be willing or perhaps they don't even exist any longer in the first place to regain their status in a given market. So this is, once again, you have to differentiate between the long run and the short run impact. And in theory, you could say you have always have to behave if you're a monopoly as if you're a monopoly as long as it, as it is not guaranteed by laws and regulations, as if there were competition in practice, however, in particular when it comes to very complex products, to complex involving a lot of different production and processing steps and raw materials, perhaps even rare raw materials, it is not as simple as that. Speaking of the sources, the main treaty obligations and treaties that have to be considered here are first Article 6 of the GATT. This is what you could say the dumping provision in the GATT and as I've indicated earlier, there is a specific agreement regulating the measures the WTO members can take against dumping, the WTO's anti-dumping agreement. Dumping itself is not prohibited by WTO law. There is no general obligation to refrain from dumping. It is not even regulated by WTO law itself. Rather, WTO law, as a result, of the negotiations in previous trade rounds. So for example, the Tokyo round where first attempts were made to regulate dumping in the so-called code system. However, the main result was to focus on the actions states take against dumping from other countries and producers from other countries, or in other words, the reactions they take. So they face a situation where they fear that their domestic industry might be harmed or is actually harmed and what reactions can they take. So once again, striking the balance between what is considered as a reasonable policy against dumped imports. On the other hand, however, you want to prevent abuse. As we know, this is a recurring theme in international trade law. And generally speaking, three conditions have to be met so that anti-dumping measures, so reactions to dumping, can be implemented. First, dumping. There needs to be dumping. So we'll speak a bit in the next few minutes about the very definition of dumping. Second, the domestic industry that is producing the like product suffers from material injury or there is a threat of material injury. And last but not least, you need causality. So in other words, dumping is the reason why there is injury to a domestic 
industry and not a mere correlation. Correlation meaning that two events may take place at a similar time, however, they're not related. So I'm sitting now in my room. It might be the case that there is a car accident somewhere out there with no one being injured, however, but I'm not causal for that. I did not cause it. My actions here have nothing to do with it. They simply occurred at the same time. However, if I do shout out of my window or use a laser pointer, or whatever you may do, that may cause a car accident, then there is causality. And speaking of which, transplanting these thoughts to dumping, this is what you need here. You need a causal link between, on the one hand, dumped imports and, on the other hand, injury or a threat of injury to the respective relevant domestic industry producing the like product. And also what deserves to be mentioned at this point already, even if there is some injury that can be attributed to dumping, but not all of it, you can also only take reactions or measures, implement measures to the extent to which you can attribute the injury to domestic, uh, to foreign imports and not blame the foreign imports for everything if there are also other reasons why there is an injury to the domestic industry. The definition, the technical one, can be found in Article 2, Paragraph 1 of the Anti-Dumping Agreement, which holds that, and I quote, a product is to be considered as being dumped, i.e. introduced into the commerce of another country at less than its normal value, if the other, if the export price of the product exported from one country to another is less than the comparable price in the ordinary course of trade for the like product when destined for consumption in the exporting country." End quote. So this is the technical definition and let's go a bit further into detail what is meant by this provision in the anti-dumping agreement. So this matters first and foremost when it comes to the calculation of dumping and the reactions you may take, the anti-dumping duties, because they can only be imposed up to the maximum level of dumping. So if there is dumping of say 20%, the anti-dumping duties may also only amount to 20% and not more than that. And ideally speaking, they would be at a lower level. But what you're making here when doing this calculation, you compare the normal value with the export price of the like product. And this difference then is the maximum margin of dumping that can be applied. So the first determination we have to make here is that of normal value. There are three different methods of calculating, of determining the normal value. The first one is you simply look at the price of the like product in the exporter's domestic market. That is the one mentioned in Article 2.1 of the Anti-Dumping Agreement. You simply look at what price a product is being sold back home. Easy. However, there are situations when the home market doesn't really produce such a normal value. So it might be the case that their product is not even being sold at the home market, or there is only a low value of sales in the home market, or there is a somewhat special market situation, one that is not based on real market or free market forces, because for example, the government sets the prices. And in such situations, Article 2, Paragraph 2 of the Anti-Dumping Agreement mentions other ways of determining the local and normal value. First, you look at the representative price that is being charged by the exporter in another country, or you make a calculation that is based on a combination, first, on the exporters of the exporter's production costs, other expenses that are involved in the pro production of a certain product, and also you look at what are the normal profit margins for such products. And this is where we enter the political realm. Why that? Because there is the question what to do with non-market economies. Where do we, how do we know what the normal value is in this country where the government sets the prices or where there is not really competition as I've indicated earlier. What is a non-market economy? The definition is an economy where the government has a complete or substantially complete monopoly of its trade and where all domestic prices are fixed by the state. So the key prime example here, communist market situation. And here, and this, what I mentioned earlier, this is why it becomes political. China is still considered as a non-market economy to the detriment of China. Why to the detriment? 
because there is a significant level of discretion when it comes to calculating the normal value. So countries have much more discretion. Discretion, on the one hand, is great because it offers flexibility. However, if you're the affected country, it's not great because it means more leeway, more room for abuse, or not even abuse, but you don't really know how to determine the normal value. You can resort to a vast number of measures, to a vast number of calculation methods, and at the end of the day, you don't even know whether a country is trying to exploit your status as a non-market economy to say that the normal value is much higher than it really is. So one example that was used by the European Union or the European communities, the predecessor to the European Union, was the third country method. This is the price of the like product on the domestic market of an appropriate comparable country, the so-called surrogate country. And that was done in the EC fasteners case involving China, where the European Commission determined the value of the fasteners of Chinese exporters on the basis of Indian fasteners. So China could then argue, wait, the price that you find on the Indian market is a completely different one from ours. The producers are completely different. The market situation, perhaps for cultural reasons, or also because India does have a lot of inhabitants, but not as many as China, or whatever other reasons, is not comparable. However, what else should you do? How else do you determine a normal value? So a lot of leeway to the detriment of China, and that's why China doesn't really like the status as a non-market economy, because whenever it comes to dumping, China then is worse off than countries where you would simply say, okay, this is a market situation. You simply look at the price that is being charged back home. However, here in the example of China, you would disregard the price on the Chinese market. The next question we have to ask ourselves is that of like product. So as you know by now, that's a recurring theme. The question when and under what circumstances are two different products however, still considered as sufficiently identical to be considered as like products. We've talked about that already in connection with most Fair Nation. We have talked about it already in connection with national treatment. We will talk about it here again when it comes to dumping, because once again, you compare international price discrimination when it comes to like products, the products that are being produced at home by domestic manufacturers. And you find a definition in Article 2.6 of the Anti-Dumping Agreement. And I quote again, throughout this agreement, so the Anti-Dumping Agreement, the term like product, produit similaire, shall be interpreted to mean a product which is identical, i.e. alike in all respects to the product under consideration, or in the absence of such a product, another product which, although not alike in all respects, has characteristics closely resembling those of the product under consideration. So in contrast to the national treatment obligation, where you find extensive case law on the notion of likeness and also the contrast to directly competitive or substitutable products, which you could say implicitly is also relevant here because you see here another product which might not which is not alike in all respects, but is closely resembling the characteristics of another product. So maybe that is somewhat similar to the notion of directly competitive or substitutable products, the broader category. You find in GATT Article 3, Paragraph 2 on national treatment. However, there is no case law by the WTO dispute settlement body or panels and the applet body that has been produced on this question yet. So there are lots of disputes surrounding dumping, but the question of likeness Maybe because here we have a definition of likeness has not been an issue here. There are many other issues, the calculation of dumping, different calculation methods. Um, for example, we'll talk about that later, but the question of likeness has not yet been discussed by WTO dispute settlement, by the WTO dispute settlement body or um, panels or the applet body. Then the next question we have to ask ourselves is, how to determine the export price of a product. So now that we know the normal price, the price in the home market, or the, the construed price, the construed normal price of a product, and then we have to compare it with the export price. And this one is defined as the transaction price at which the foreign producer sells the product to an importer in the importing country. However, there may also be situation, again, 
similar to normal value where there is no export price at all or no reliable export price. So there might be an export transaction that is, if you look behind the veil, an internal transfer or the product is merely exchanged in a barter transaction or there is a close association between the export and the importer, perhaps they're even part of the same mother company. And there you have to resort to other measures of calculation. Again, one is the constructed export price. That's a calculation on the basis of the price at which the imported products are first resold to an independent buyer, or in situations where you don't even have such an independent buyer, you make a determination on a reasonable basis. Once again, lots of leeway, wide margin of discretion, but however, again, that provides ample room for uncertainty. And then after having established both of these prices, the normal value and the export price, then we have to make a fair comparison. Why fair? Because this is the margin of dumping or the maximum level of anti-dumping duties that can be imposed. And there are in general different calculations and this is where it becomes juicy. Because on the one hand you can make a transaction to transaction comparison or a weighted average to weighted average comparison. The big question here is however, you look at the average of products and only then will you consider it as dumping or would you say if a certain product itself is being sold at below market price or below the normal value, you already have dumping. Or would you simply say you look at the sum of all products and if the sum of them is being exported at a lower price than the one charged at home, only then you have dumping. What is also relevant here is prospective dumping and retrospective dumping. So do you look back in the past or do you look back, back to the future, one could say. This is the vast difference between the European Union, how it determines dumping and anti-dumping duties, and the United States, forward-looking or backward-looking. And in general, what can be said at this point is that one specific practice is being disallowed, and this is where we will talk about it at a later stage, um, is so-called zeroing. So where you would say all export prices that are being sold that are set above the normal value are counted as zero. So you don't look at the average. However, as you will see at a later stage, however, this calculation of dumping is considered as somewhat unfair, so unfairness to unfairness, you could say, and therefore has been in numerous cases by the WTO outlawed or considered as illegal under WTO law, but we'll come back to that at a later stage. When making this comparison, in addition to what we already said, there needs to be due allowance for factors that may affect the comparability of prices. So in theory, all of that may sound simple, but for example, the conditions and terms of sale or taxation or the levels of trade or any other differences which are demonstrated to affect price comparability, as it is mentioned and I quoted Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the Anti-Dumping Agreement, all of them have to be taken into account when comparing the normal value with the export prices. And in addition, exporters, they have to substantiate their requests for adjustments whenever it comes to this comparison between normal value and the export price. So once again, this is at the heart of the debate surrounding dumping. To which level, up to which level may you impose anti-dumping duties? What is the exact price difference between the normal value and the export price? And last but not least, in this connection, we have to determine the material injury or the threat of material injury. So the domestic industry is suffering as a result from dumped imports. And first we have here a definition of the domestic industry in Article 4, Paragraph 1 of the Anti-Dumping Agreement, i.e., and I quote again, the, dumping, the domestic producers as a whole of the like products or to those of them whose collective output of the products constitutes a major proportion of the total domestic production of those products. So a major proportion However, does not mean a majority here, so not more than 50%, but it needs to be significant. If it's only a very, very small fraction of an industry that is being harmed or which faces a threat by dumped imports, that is insignificant. However, once again, the precise percentage of 
a certain industry to be considered as falling under Article 4.1 of the Anti-Dumping Agreement is unclear, but some 25-30% would certainly be sufficient. And in this regard, what also has to be mentioned is that it may also be relevant when it comes to the establishment of a domestic industry. We'll come to that at a later stage. What I want to mention at this point, however, is that there might be cases where you don't even have a domestic industry, but other producers in other countries say, okay, we don't even want a domestic industry to emerge, so we will dump preventively, so to say. However, in such situations, even though there is no injury because there is the fundamental basis lacking, i.e. an existing, a pre-existing industry. However, in such situations, even if there are advanced plans to establish such a domestic industry, so for example, capital has already been invested, there are construction plans for a factory and so on and so forth. In such situations, they may also be protected with anti-dumping duties. If, as I said, foreign compute consumer uh, foreign producers want to prevent the establishment of such a competitor in the first place good how do we determine the injury however here you need positive evidence so you have to examine both the volume of the dumped imports and also the effect of these dumped imports on a domestic market price for like products and in addition you also have to examine the impact of these imports on the domestic producers of such products. So both the price, the domestic market price, plus what happens if the domestic market price is artificially lowered or faces pressure from the outside by dumped imports. And when determining the injury then, you have to look at Article 3, Paragraph 2 of the Anti-Dumping Agreement. So this provision regulates how the investigating authority, so in a given market, so by the European Union, for example, or in the US, these are the two main countries when it comes to cases surrounding dumping, how these investigating domestic authorities, so these are domestic servants, these are domestic agencies, or in the European Union, on the European Union level, these are EU agencies that have to bind or have to adhere to certain rules when considering whether there has been a significant increase in the volume of dumped imports and when it comes to determining the effect of these dumped imports. So has there been a significant price undercutting? Is there price depression and or price suppression? Is there really an impact or is it because perhaps it is insignificant, no impact at all or not a substantial impact? And then when determining the injury, you have a list of economic factors that also have to be examined. This is a list of examples, but the most important ones, but this is not an exhaustive list. This is a list of possible factors that can be taken into account, but not the only ones. So what you look here when investigating the impact of dumped imports, sales volumes, profits, the output, market share, productivity, return on investments, ROI, the utilization of the production capacity of the domestic industry factors affecting domestic prices, the magnitude of the margin of dumping, negative effects on cash flow, inventories, employment, wages, growth, the ability to raise capital or investments. These are indicators, general economic indicators that are relevant when determining the injury to the domestic industry. But however, this is not an exhaustive list. This is an enumerative list, i.e. a list of factors that have to be taken into account, but these are not all of the factors that can be relevant when making this assessment. When it comes to determining whether there is a threat to the domestic injury, you have to look at the facts. So simply the fear that there might be an injury is obviously enough not sufficient. You look at real possibilities. You look at what is happening on the ground. Is it imminent, in other words? So you wouldn't be able to say, okay, in 10 years there might be some negative impact, no, it has to be imminent and foreseeable. So it has to be clear if this situation continues, there will be a substantial threat. So we have to take action at an earliest, at the earliest stage possible, but however, not too early because that would be preventive in the sense, just like similar to self-defense, if you take preventive action because some other state may attack you in 10 years, 
that would be illegal again here if you take preventive action because you think that dumped imports may have a negative impact in 10 or 20 years that would again also stretch the time limit here too wide and here when it comes to material injury or the threat of injury you also look at factors like is there a significant rate of increase of dumped imports is there an increased capacity of the exporter which may be an indicator of the likelihood of such an increase so you see okay wait the export is already gearing up to import and at prices at dump prices to import more or are imports entering at prices that will have a significant depressing or suppressing effect on domestic prices which then will increase demand for further imports so people notice wait it's so cheap let's buy more could be another factor here or other inventories of the investigated product so and last but not least as i've indicated already when it comes to material retardation of the establishment of a domestic industry there you have to show that this is not just some remote plan that maybe some policymakers, some politicians heads of states or heads of government have thought about establishing for example a car industry would be great in some 15 years time no there needs to be convincing evidence that such an industry is indeed being planned and indeed about to be established so you need advanced plans for such a new industry a factory is perhaps even already constructed or new equipment has already been ordered so indeed it is about to be established and not might be or likely to be established in some five to ten years time so again here you have to debate preventive and preemptive action when it comes to anti-dumping measures and last but not least in connection of the three tier determinations that have to be made you look at the causality between dumping and the injury or the threat of injury and that is being regulated by article 3.5 of the anti-dumping agreement so the dumping itself must be the cause of the material injury to the domestic industry not necessarily the only one or the main cause however which means that if there are other factors that lead to the injury or the threat of injury so for example there are um, other factors such as the volume and price of imports that are not being sold at dumping at dumped prices or there's a contraction in demand or changes in the patterns of consumption people just simply consume other products for other reasons than the price or there are trade restrictive practices of and competition between the foreign and domestic producers or there are developments technological developments and the export performance and productivity of the domestic industry they are also changed over time for whatever reasons if these factors contribute to the injury or the threat of injury they have to be you could say taken out of the equation when determining whether they can be attributed to dumping in other words you can't blame everything on dumping if there are other reasons why there is an injury or a threat of injury to the domestic industry producing a like product and this then leads us to anti-dumping investigations as we've already said this is done at a national level or in the case of the european union at an eu level so the european commission as such has to determine whether there is dumping and what to take against it so all of these determinations are not done by the wto or international bodies they are done by domestic bodies or by the european union and wto law however include has a number of rules on evidence which type of evidence is relevant so the ones submitted by domestic producers and then counter evidence by foreign producers where they would say wait this is not dumping what we're doing here or when they produce evidence to show that the injury is being caused by other factors than the dumped imports and also publication notification requirements so once you start anti-dumping investigations you have to tell foreign importers exporters depending on your perspective that they have that they have started you need independent tribunals to review um, or make the final determinations so in other words to avoid bias here again here rule of law and fair trial rights quasi fair trial rights are also applicable in international trade law and why do we need all of that you need an objective and transparent procedure when it comes to dumping because as we've indicated earlier there is so much possibility in a negative sense for exploitation also you want all interested parties so all 
foreign producers, foreign market players to have the opportunity to defend their interests against, against partial or unobjective reviews of their trade practices. And last but not least, what also matters in this connection is that the investigating authorities, they have to explain the basis for their determination. So they have to say on the basis of all the evidence we've received and we've taken into account, we have come to the assumption that first there was dumping and also the extent to which dumping has occurred. So, however, how are they being started? You need some level of support among the domestic industry that is being regulated by in Article 5.4 of the anti-dumping agreement. So they have to produce at least 50%, they have to be at least involved of the like product domestically and some 25% have to expressly support these anti-dumping investigations. In other words, simply because the government accuses foreign producers of engaging in dumping, if the domestic industry says there is no dumping at all or the dumping is not really harming us, then the government may not proceed. And there are also reasons when dumping, anti-dumping investigations have to end. For example, if there is not sufficient evidence or if dumping does occur but it is insignificantly small, so too small to have an actual impact, usually less than 2%, and that is also explicitly regulated, less than 2% of the export price is dumping here. That may have some effect, but not a substantial effect. Also, if there is dumping at a, lay, at a lower, higher level, sorry, at a higher level, but there are only very, very little, and in some, in some the sum of dumping, of dumped imports is very little, so less than 3%, of the total imports of that of these products again then anti-dumping investigations have to come to an end because there is no real impact on the domestic producers but once again if dumping occurs so what you look here is not a specific country or specific producers you look at the impact of dumping on the domestic producers of the domestic on the domestic market actors so investigations even if the two percent three percent requirements are not being met they may continue if producers from several countries if all of them supply less than three percent but if they, you bundle them together they account for seven percent of the total imports then they may still proceed so once again because the focus is on the impact of the domestic producers and not really on the actions of the foreign exporters how are these anti-dumping investigations then to be conducted? As we've noticed, noted already, new process or quasi-fair trial rights. So all interested parties have to be notified. They have to have an opportunity to present all the relevant evidence, to submit letters or other written statements. It also the evidence produced by others. So for example, by the domestic industry has to be made available and in due course, to all other participants to such anti-dumping investigations unless they're really confidential because they're, every company may have its own secrets. Think of intellectual property rights. Then the exporters, the foreign producers that are involved, they need to have at least 30 days to reply to the accusations of dumping and they have a right to participate in the proceedings and also make presentations on their behalf. And last but not least, the decision, the final outcome of anti-dumping investigations has to be communicated to all involved parties or all affected parties. So, and what after these investigations have been made or during these investigations, what measures can be taken? And there are three different anti-dumping measures. First, on a provisional basis, so to react as soon as possible, as quickly as possible, there are provisional measures, then you have price undertakings, and last but not least, so-called definitive anti-dumping duties. So once you have come to the conclusion as a state investigating authority that dumping does indeed occur, you may react by imposing what we mentioned at the very beginning, higher tariffs or higher duties than usual. If there is, however, a preliminary affirmative finding of dumping and injury and causation, you may impose provisional anti-dumping measures. During the investigation already, However, if these provisional anti-dumping measures are necessary to prevent injury during the investigation period. So, in other words, once you have started, once you have said, okay, we're not there yet, we have not 100% established dumping, but there is 
already injury and we're fairly certain that there is injury from this point on when you have made the preliminary affirmative finding you can also apply preliminary um, provisional anti-dumping measures. The other one that is mentioned here or is relevant here are so-called voluntary price undertakings. So there is a reason why some 20% of all WTO cases deal with dumping because this is a painful complex and sometimes also politically very sensitive process. So countries may also try to avoid such a situation or say, okay, you know, you, you've started already, but we don't want, neither of us really wants that. So exporters could then voluntarily agree to revise their export prices or cease to export at dump prices to avoid the final outcome, i.e. anti-dumping duties. So they would say, you know what? Let's skip this step. Let's never ever come to the conclusion whether there is dumping, yes or no. We will, as a sign of goodwill or because we don't have the resources or not the ambition to be involved until the end and we don't really want to be charged with anti-dumping duties, we will increase our prices again or we will lower or stop to dump our products or to export dump products at all. So voluntary price undertakings, as the name already says, you could say as a sign of goodwill or also as a sign of exhaustion or you don't want even want to be exhausted in the first place. And then last but not least, anti-dumping measures, the main anti-dumping measures, definitive anti-dumping duties. As we've said already, they have however a certain limit and that the margin of dumping is the one that also sets the limit for anti-dumping duties. So if there is dumping at price difference of 15%, then the anti-dumping duty may only, again, amount to a maximum of 15%. Because again, this is about to, this is about re-establishing normal price then, and, or to end pri international price discrimination, but not to discriminate in favor of your domestic producers. So you cannot, in other words, you cannot combat unfair trade with unfair trade or with protectionism. This is allowed protectionism, legitimate protectionism, in the sense that you, there is unfair competition, you want to make it fair again and not tweak it to this ex, to an extent at which you yourself become an unfair market actor here. So what you have to do when making a comparison, I've indicated that earlier, you have to look usually at the average of the differences between the export prices and the home market prices of the product in question. In other words, Zeroing is not allowed. I will come to that in a minute with the next slide. They also have to be collected on a non-discriminatory basis and retroactive application is only possible if there was indeed material injury. If there was only a threat of injury but it has not materialized, then you cannot apply anti-dumping duties retroactively. If the provisional measures we have mentioned earlier, if they have exceeded the amount of the final duty or if they have been collected on the finding of a threat of material or material retardation, but there was no real injury, then the duties, the provisional ones, have to be transferred back. Again, here you want to avoid a situation where a government or a state wants to benefit. Again, this is about re-establishing fair trade. And the dumping margin usually is calculated for each exporter individually, but if there is a large number of producers then you can only look at a limited number of them and there you make individual investigations and then look at the weighted average and apply it for everyone. However, caveat here, if a producer provides evidence for its specific product, then you have to make a calculation individually as well. So it could be the case that the average of dumping is much higher than for a specific producer or a specific producer is not dumping in the first place providing evidence showing that, wait, we are not the bad guys here, we did not commit dumping, individual curtail, you could say tailor-made dumping investigation individually, and then, however, the dumping margin has to be calculated for this specific producer, even if there is a large number of exporters, uh, of producers that commit dumping. And now the time has come where I would like to go a bit more into detail concerning zeroing. As I've indicated earlier, this is a very delicate topic because this is the practice of anti-dumping calculations the United States is resorting to. So 
One of the key reasons why the US administration of Donald Trump and the US in general is somewhat angry at the WTO why it is blocking the appointment of new members of the appellate body is because it has lost several cases concerning anti-dumping investigations. And one of the reasons why the US has lost these cases is because it resorts to a practice called zeroing. The technical definition is disregarding or putting a value of zero on instances when the export price is higher than the home market price. So what you do here when determining the export price, you say, okay, you only look at the cheap prices and not, however, or not at the products that are sold at a higher price. So drawing a comparison to the average height of a basketball team, and this is, by the way, the reason why am I showing you, why am I showing you this picture of the Detroit Pistons from 2004, by the way, not of the Chicago Bulls, even though I know everyone now is talking about Michael Jordan and his final season in the last dance. However, I'm a Detroit Pistons fan, and this is the last really successful Detroit Pistons team. Right now they're really bad, but they used to be much better. This is a team that won the NBA championship back in 2004. However, going back to international trade law, when determining the export price of products, you look at the average in general. So you also look at those products that are sold at a higher price. However, what the US is doing with zeroing, to put it simple, to put it simply, they say, no, we only look at the cheap ones, at the cheap products, and if something, when determining the average, something is sold at a higher price, we simply disregard it. So, and this is where I draw the parallel to basketball, and I have this idea from the Trade Talks podcast, where they were talking about the average height of a volleyball team. However, since I'm a basketball fan, I would like to calculate the average height of a basketball team and a particularly great basketball team with you. So, we have five players here. You could say they're all the equivalents of products when thinking about trade law terms. Chauncey Billups, the point guard with number one, six feet, three inches. Richard Hamilton, shooting guard, number 32, six feet, seven inches. Tayshawn Prince, small forward, number 22, six feet, nine inches. Ben Wallace, power forward, number three, officially listed as six feet, nine inches, but as you can see in this picture, he's certainly somewhat shorter than Tayshawn Prince. And last but not least, at center, Rashid Wallace, six feet, 11 inches. So if you add all of their numbers, and then the average height of a Detroit Pistons starting five player would be six feet, seven inches. However, this is not what the US does. This is not how the US would determine the average height of this basketball team, or going back to trade law, how it would apply, how it would determine the average export price of a certain product. No, it would simply say all the players that are higher, or if you speak about prices, higher or taller than the home market and at the home market are disregarded. So in this connection, Mr. Prince would be left out of the equation and Mr. Wallace would simply be considered as being irrelevant. And then if you do the math, when only looking at Mr. Billups, Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Wallace, you would have an average height of a little bit up below six feet six, so a bit shorter than Michael Jordan, so that he's also mentioned here. So as you can imagine here, however, this is, when we go back to dumping, somewhat unfair, because that means that the price is even lower when it comes to calculating dumping than it really is, because you don't look at all of the products and some might be sold at a higher price. No, you only look at the cheap ones. And this goes back to what you really consider as dumping. And if you consider dumping individually for each and every product, if it is sold at a very low price and a much lower price than at the domestic market, that this is already dumping, from the perspective of the US, might be the case. But from the perspective of the WTO, it says, no, you have to look at all of the products that are being exported to a certain country. And again, just like when calculating the average height of a basketball team, you have to look at all of the players. If you look at the average export price of a product, you have to look at all of the products and not only those products that are particularly cheap. So I hope this explains the practice of zeroing to you and also somewhat makes you understand why the WTO repeatedly in numerous cases has rejected this practice of calculating 
the export price and of calculating the anti-dumping measure or the anti-dumping duty that can be imposed by a given state. So, having said that, now a little bit about the imposition of, anti of definitive anti-dumping duties and the extent to which and the time period, so i.e. how long they may be imposed. So only as long and to the extent necessary to react to injurious dumping. That is regulated in Article 11, Paragraph 1 of the Anti-Dumping Agreement. Secondly, there need to be periodic reviews, so you have to establish whether there is still an injury going on, whether dumping is still going on, and there is a five years maximum amount of time until they have to be abolished. However, if an earlier review is so-called sunset review, so a review that is being taken before a measure comes to its end, when such a review establishes that the, abolish, the elimination of anti-dumping duties would lead to a continuation or recurrence of dumping and also of the injury, then you can impose anti-dumping duties even longer than five years. When it comes to dispute settlement, so as I've indicated already earlier, when it comes to dispute settlement concerning anti-dumping, there are certain special rules. So the panel and then the appellate body may only examine whether the evaluation of the evidence was unbiased and objective. So this is sort of a review of what was done by the investigating authorities. But you simply look at, okay, not the evidence itself, but how the evidence itself was being evaluated by the domestic authorities. Again here, you look at, simply put, the general international law rules when it comes to interpreting the anti-dumping agreement in Article 6 of the GET. What you, these you find in the Vienna Convention on Law of Treaties from 1969. And if there are several interpretations that can be found in one of the treaties or the provisions that I've just mentioned, you look at the one that is, or you can only look at one of them. And in essence, there shall be no contradictory results. This is an example of anti-dumping investigations, how they are being conducted at the European Union level. Just to show you, you see here on the one hand the time period, then however the main steps that are being taken, so the approval of the complaint, then a notice of the initiation, a pre-disclosure, then the publication of provisional measures, the disclosure of definitive findings, and then the publication of definitive measures. And then at all phases there are different steps that parties that are interested, so those that are affected by anti-dumping measures or by the dumping itself, which they may take. To show you just an example of what is happening here at the European Union level. And, however, a few words on the special interests and special needs of developing country members of the WTO. There is a specific provision on them that says that special regard must be given by the richer countries to the special situation of developing country members when considering the application of anti-dumping measures and therefore the, art uh, the article here calls on them to resort to possibilities of constructive remedies before applying anti-dumping duties, in particular if they affect the essential interests of developing country members. So. There is, in other words, in WTO law, in Article 15 of the Anti-Dumping Agreement, a preference for so-called constructive remedies. So, on the one hand, they should impose lower duties than the one to which they have determined that there is dumping. So, if there is dumping of 20%, then Article 15 calls on the richer countries to say, but please still don't only apply 15% or maybe even only 10%. Don't make use of the full extent to which you may impose anti-dumping duties and also price undertakings are also to be preferred. So what we mentioned earlier when an exporter voluntarily agrees to raise the export price to avoid an anti-dumping duty in the first place. But however this is not obligatory, this is simply a call on domestic, uh, on foreign producers, on, on richer countries to resort to such practices instead of going the tough route playing the tough guys and saying, okay, we will make full use of all the opportunities that are being granted to us under the anti-dumping agreement and Article 6 of the GATT. Having said that, 
that concludes our session on dumping. I hope it was interesting for you. In the next one, we'll talk about subsidization. There are many similarities to anti-dumping. However, there are also some differences. All of that will, however, be discussed in our next trade law lecture. For the time being, I wish all of you, depending on at what time you're watching this, a great start of the day, a great rest of the day, or a good evening, or a good night. Goodbye, everyone.